Now, just a little bit about Beijing, which we've mentioned a couple of times. Uh, for most of the period, it was the capital city, and under the emperors,、uh, the forbidden city, which lay at the heart of Beijing, was where the imperial government sat. It was known as the Forbidden City because you were forbidden to enter it, and if you entered it without an invitation or without permission, then you would be executed. The first emperor to unite China, Shi Huangdi, established the Qin Dynasty. He also started the Great Wall, and he's the one who's buried at Xi'an with over seven thousand terracotta soldiers. The Qin's were followed by the Han Emperor,、uh, Guangzhou, who established his dynasty, the Han Dynasty. Uh, he extended the Great Wall and also developed the actual governmental system. There was a period of civil war following the Han Dynasty, and after that came the Su Dynasty, the Tang Dynasty, another period of civil war, and then the Song Dynasty. Now the Song Dynasty were up to the Norman Conquest time, so 960 to 1127. They made various changes. But they were overthrown, or at least partly, by the Mongols sweeping in from the north across the Great Wall, and in particular the Jin Dynasty, who established themselves in the north, while the Song Dynasty continued in the south. China was united again in 1279 by Kublai Khan. He was the great grandson of Genghis Khan, and therefore also、uh, Mongols who come in from the north.、Um, and his dynasty lasted till 1368, the Common Era. That was followed by the Ming Dynasty in 1368. Now they were native to China,、uh, descendants, in fact, of the Han, and they forced the the ones, the Mongols, out. Now in 1405 and 1421, they actually started trying to explore the、um, southwards and westwards. They got as far as Arabia, and actually, if they probably sent another expedition, they probably would have found Europe before Europe found China. But the Ming's were overthrown by Manchus from the north, who established the Qing Dynasty, and the Qing Dynasty lasted until 1912 of the Common Era.、Um, a couple of things they brought in was a ending foot binding. They also brought the far western provinces under Chinese control. Now, in 1793,、um, the British ambassador McCartney、uh, journeyed to China to try and persuade China. To open up for trade, and he eventually was allowed permission to enter the Forbidden City and present his case to the Chinese emperor. But the Chinese really weren't interested in trade with anywhere else, least of all Britain.、Uh, the emperor replied to McCartney, "As your ambassador conceived for himself, we possess all these things. I set no value in objects strange or ingenious, and have no use for your country's manufactures." And so Lord Macartney was sent off. Now, this, in some sense, symbolises both China's inward-looking nature, but also the fact that they were just far advanced compared to the rest of the world. Pre-nineteenth-century China surpassed any other country. It had a far greater population. It produced thirty-three percent of the world's total manufactured goods. I think at this point, Britain only produces four percent. There were more books published in Chinese than in all other languages put together. They had far more raw materials and far better transport, far better postal system, far better communication system, and a far more complex system of selecting the best people for their civil service. Mandarins, as they were called,、uh, went through a system of rigorous examinations to establish who would actually get to the highest level of the civil service. However. From the 18th century, China was beginning to go into decline. There were increasingly land problems.、Um, the Chinese rule was that all male heirs inherited the land, and therefore family holdings became smaller and smaller. And Britain and other Western countries are overtaking China in iron production and the production of raw, raw materials. Deforestation in the north has led to floods,、um, impoverishment of the soil, which therefore in turn led to famine. And Western countries are making greater advances in science and medicine. So China goes from being far more advanced than any Western country, and let's not forget that they had invented writing and gunpowder and paper money long before anyone in the West. And they actually are in decline now, and therefore they start to become victims of Western expansion and colonialism. In the 19th century,、uh, China is forced to open up. It has been essentially inward-looking, what's called Sino-centric. 
but it's forced by European powers to open up to trade, and most noticeably with Britain, it forced it to take its opium through the Opium Wars of 1830s to 1860s, and along with other countries, they forced China to accept unequal treaties whereby they were given concessions or privileged rights within China. Over 50 treaty ports were created, and these were actually under the control of Western countries. Concessions were set up in many Chinese cities. Now, these are actually areas within the city which are under the European control and therefore have European powers. If you look here at this map of Tianjin in 1912, you can see there's a Japanese concession. So this is where the Japanese laws would, would be enforced. You have a German concession, a British concession. You have a French concession, another Japanese concession, Italian concession, Russian concession even Austro-Hungarian concession. So these were all areas where different European powers had their trading posts, but also their laws had to be f followed there. From the 1890s then, you have this scramble for concessions, whereby the Western powers are exerting their control and influence over China. In 1898, uh, Britain gained control of Hong Kong, and this would have carried on with more Western countries gaining more land, except that in 1899, USA tried to put a stop to it through its open door policy. What they basically said was they would not allow any country to force China to grant it any preferential trading rights. And because of America's power, therefore the Western countries backed off from it. However, 1904, Britain is still able to march to Tibet and force the emperor to recognize Tibetan independence. Now, China was not the only country having this treatment at the hands of the Western powers. Japan also uh, was being forced to accept unequal treaties. Now, China and Japan shared similar attitudes to the outside world. They're both very inward-looking, both felt they were both superior to anyone else, and therefore it was a huge shock and humiliation when along come these Western powers and they forced them to accept these unequal treaties. However, Japan's response was to rapidly reform themselves and their economy, their military and their political systems. They restructured their army on German lines and they restructured their navy on British lines. And therefore, in 1895, they were able to defeat China and in 1905, able to defeat Russia. And this actually marked Japan's emergence onto the world stage. Now, China seeing this, they both admire Japan, but also they hated Japan because Japan themselves then start to force themselves on China. And so we can sum up China in 1900 as having an unstable imperial government, a very long-standing imperial government, but increasingly unstable and corrupt. You have massive resentment at the presence of the colonial powers, all their concessions and unequal treaties and treaty ports. You have China being defeated by Japan, and they're humiliated, and therefore seeking national pride. There is a rise in nationalism, but overall they're economically, politically, socially, and militarily backward.